How's it going everyone? Welcome back to another exciting video. Today we have ourselves the Alston Z3 projector. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Now this is one of the most exciting projectors that I've got in a long while. And I do have a couple more projector reviews coming up and they're also as exciting. However, this is going to be one of the projectors that I could definitely recommend for a long while. It is native 1080p, plenty bright, it's got built in Android, it's very quiet, it's got a dust filter, and the killer feature of having a lens cover that does not fall off when focusing the lens. It's crazy, I know, we finally did it. So anyways, we have the lens here, we have the infrared sensor on the front, little logo, it's got a nice rubbery matte finish. Both on the left and right side, we got the speakers. On the bottom, we got four rubber feet, the front kickstand, as well as a standard tripod mount so you can easily mount it anywhere, which is very, very handy. But what you also have on the bottom here is actually the exhaust. As the intake here is thankfully filtered, it's a nice big dust filter, so it should help the LCD and the lens elements stay dust free. And finally, we have the power button, the dedicated Bluetooth button, so you can use this thing as a speaker, audio out, a single HDMI, two USBs, the rear infrared sensor, as well as the power input. Now, of course, it would be nice to have another HDMI port, but this is more of a portable projector and it's got built-in Androids. So you don't really have to get yourself a Roku or a Chromecast if you just want to watch YouTube. You can easily use the built-in casting system or play videos directly on the system itself. And stick around because the built-in system here is pretty awesome and you can actually go ahead and play some games directly on it. You can do some game streams or run RetroArch and play games directly on the system itself. Now, of course, being Android and having Bluetooth, you can go ahead and connect a keyboard, a mouse, and have yourself a pretty interesting experience. So with that said, let's go ahead and set up and show you guys what this thing is all about. All right, so here's the setup. We are currently projecting against a white wall. It is about 100 inches worth of screen. And currently the focus distance is about 115 inches between the wall and the projector lens. That being said, what you're looking at here is actually not the native projector launcher. Instead, this is something I have installed and about 90% of the applications that you see here on the screen are actually installed by me through Aptoid. I'll show you guys how to get that set up as the Android system here is actually not very well advertised and there is barely any information or mention of it on their own website, which is very interesting since I do consider this to be kind of a big feature. So with that, let's go ahead and turn on the original launcher, which is called Whale TV Open Launcher and take a look at what we get out of the box. So as you can see, it's got that typical TV OS kind of look. It's a bit cluttered. It's trying to give you a bunch of different information, but it's not that really useful. It kind of just takes up space. We got some random banners on the top. On the bottom, we got Facebook, which uh, I don't know why that is here. We have YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, you know, Prime Video. You can go ahead and move on to the app section, and that's where you can have some more uh, random banners of, you know, Parasite, Again, more Bollywood, Netflix, and who knows if these banners will actually ever update. It does feel like it's been the same for a couple weeks now. Moving on down here, basically we're in the app section. We can go ahead and click on the videos. And here we can kind of browse the different applications that are available for video streaming, music streaming, and all that good stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff you can go through here. We got some games, I guess. You know, they're very simple, very basic. They're going to run all right, but none of these are really that interesting. We have various applications that you might find useful. We do have 8064 if you want to take a look at some details like your CPU, RAM, GPU. We have uh, File Explorer, Kodi, MX Player, VLC, and these are most likely the ones that you're going to be probably using. Next up, we have the My App section, and that just basically shows you what you have installed. And again, it's not very organized, doesn't look all that great. It takes a couple clicks to even get to this menu, so not that intuitive. But again, I've already worked around that with that really awesome ATV menu. But before we go ahead and move on to that, let me go ahead and show you what you have installed out of the box. So we do have the local file manager, and uh, it's very simple and straightforward. You can open videos, pictures, songs, and run some applications. Now installing some applications through this file manager don't really work all that well sometimes, so it would be good to install an alternative like ES File Explorer. Next up, you get the regular standard browser. We do have Mirrorcast, AirScreen, eShare Server, iMirror, the Bluetooth casting option so you can play music on your projector through your phone to use as a Bluetooth speaker. Then we have the most important app, and that would be the YouTube app, which in this case actually has the smart YouTube version which is actually kind of a modified version of it. And when you launch it, you can actually go ahead and choose different options, how you want to stream, what kind of codecs you want to do. Very cool that it's installed out of the box and very handy when it comes to something that is low power like this one. And finally, I believe we do have Aptoid TV. I could be wrong, but uh, either way, you can install it yourself. As for MX Player, I have installed directly from their application. We have the video section, which kind of just opens up a bunch of uh, recommendations. You can play some videos. So let's go ahead and try Contraband, for example. And uh, as I can see, it wants you to install Netflix, which, uh, you know, I don't have Netflix. Then we have music, which again, is linked to a bunch of different applications. And if you click one of them again, we can see that it's coming off YouTube. 
And finally on the settings, we have the app update, which is kind of useful if you're using this craft menu. And then we have the built-in settings, which will bring you to the settings. Again, we'll talk about that in just a bit here. And finally on the top, we have the weather section. We have the notification bar, which turns into the input source. And yes, we have a dedicated button on the remote to switch between HDMI and USB. If you want to do the mirror cast, you have to open up their respective applications to access them. So with that being said, let's go ahead and click home and actually go back to the ATB launcher that I have set, which is honestly where it's at. And you know what, before we go ahead and jump into the fun stuff, let's go ahead and quickly take a look at the image quality. So what we have here is my custom projector test chart, and it is basically a 4K image that has a bunch of different lines, a bunch of different text, and a whole lot of things to look at. So starting with the middle here, we can see that things are not 100% in focus. It does look like it's in focus, and looking at it from far away, it looks pretty alright. The same goes really all the way to the middle part. You know, lines are visible, and text is visible. However, I feel like it's about 5% out of focus, you know, give or take. We can see that the live commando text on the top here is slightly out of focus compared to the bottom text. And of course, that can all depend on variation and your projector may not have that issue. It just comes down to luck. The top left corner is pretty out of focus, but at least we can read the alphabet on the big text. In our last projector review, which was quite unfortunate, was the VABS D5000 projector, and this text right here was in fact in focus. The image quality and the focus quality on that projector was insane, but unfortunately it had a couple issues which are just not acceptable. The bottom left corner is a bit better than the top right, and we can slightly see the smaller text. Bottom right seems like there's some kind of refraction, and uh, slightly worse in the top left. As for the top right, it looks like it's as focused as the bottom left. And here's one last look from far away. And since we're here, here are a couple sample images of different colors and variations. So there's a decent amount of contrast, lots of dark areas, lots of bright areas, and overall it looks exactly as it should be. Now one thing to take note of here is that you actually have no control over the image settings when you're on Android. You can only do so on the HDMI signal. But to be honest, it's alright, whatever settings they have set for the Android, it looks pretty good, very natural, and overall I really can't complain about it. So if you'd like, you can go ahead and copy my settings here for the HDMI mode, and uh, you can go ahead and make good use of it. Life at extreme altitude has shaped some of the toughest animals on the planet. It's winter and food is desperately short. So that quick clip was from Planet Earth 2, it was a 4K video being played on VLC, and it played very smoothly. So as I was saying, this is the ATV launcher, and this launcher is absolutely amazing. Then I even bought the Pro version on my phone just so I can support the developer. Since the version that I'm using on the projector here is actually a cracked Pro version, and there was no way I could buy it and have the APK directly from the developer. So for this specific app, you can go ahead and use the free version. Now, the only limitations would have to be customization. So of course, we have Aptoid, which is like the cracked version of Google Play Store. Now it's more refined. When it comes to the file manager, I prefer to use CX File Explorer here. It's very easy to use, no ads, less clutter, and I can access the network, the main storage, as well as the external USBs. Now you'll notice that the actual main storage here is set to have 5 gigabytes, and if you go ahead and check it on ADA64, it will say 3 gigabytes. But to simplify things, you're getting about 2.5 to 3 gigabytes of free space when getting this projector out of the box, which kind of limits you to what kind of things you can run here. But we do have the main important things like YouTube. And if we go ahead and press back here while it's loading, we can see that we have the modified version of YouTube, which is absolutely awesome. We have the light version and the main version, and basically you can go ahead and do a whole bunch of different settings and enable them and disable them. And all the stuff will actually go ahead and activate additional settings inside the applications themselves. Even though there is no Google services here, we can go ahead and set up our accounts so we can get a proper recommended list of videos. Anyways, that was a quick audio sample of the internal speakers. Now, depending on how you're listening to this video, it might sound alright, it might sound great, it may sound like it's muffled. And the reality of these speakers, although they're advertised to be kind of fancy and, you can, and that you can use the projector as a Bluetooth speaker, which I don't know why you would, it definitely does not live up to the marketing hype. 
Some videos sound all right and some videos just sound like they're ear piercing to the point where you have to actually go ahead and drop it from 50% all the way down to 25% just to make it sound manageable. If you are interested, I do have a video on my channel for small portable USB speakers that will sound much better than this thing. And I do have another USB powered speaker. So if you're interested, stay tuned for that. So yeah, once again, we have MX Player, we have Tubi, we have RetroArch, which will launch in just a bit. We have iMirror for Apple devices. Then we have AirScreen, which is kind of a third party application that does a decent job at having a bunch of different controls on what you could do with the stream. Overall, if we go ahead and power it up real quick, it has a pretty cool UI. It will tell you that it's ready to go. You can go ahead and cast things like your desktop or phone. Now, when it comes to frame rate, it's just all right. It's just good enough to show some pictures, a quick document maybe, but definitely nothing animated. Then we have the Home Switcher app, which is one of the most important applications that I recommend you install on this projector if you want to do what I'm doing here. It goes hand in hand with the ATV launcher. This simply lets you just go ahead and switch between the different interfaces really easily. If you're on the other one, you can go ahead and jump into this one much, much easier with just a click of a button. Basically, it's a shortcut to set your home launcher as the default. We have Steam Link. Steam Link does work. However, there's a problem where I'm getting some kind of weird flickering every 15 seconds or so. It flicks once and it's a bit too distracting. In terms of connectivity, it does a pretty good job. However, response time is a bit on the low end, which on top of the response time that already exists on the system itself, streaming a game through the local network wirelessly, that all adds up at the end of the day. And when doing a speed test inside the same room where the router is, we can see that speeds here are pretty decent on the 5 GHz network. So if you are streaming files over the network using Plex, for example, you're going to have a pretty good experience. Finally, we have Crossy Road, and this is just a quick demo. And with this one, we got to dial it down all the way here since it's a bit too loud. So what we got here is basically a MediaTek chip and it's an MT5862. Not a whole lot of information about it on Google. However, however, we can see that's a quad core ARM Cortex chip, A53 running at 1550 megahertz. And honestly, it does a pretty decent job inside this little projector and doing most of the basic tasks that you probably expect from something like this. Now, it does have one gigabyte of RAM, which is of course not that great, but since the system here is stripped down, it does manage to do a decent job at keeping up, which is something that may not be the case on another projector that we'll take a look at very soon. When it comes to the display, we can see that Android is running at 1920 by 1080 but what's more interesting is that it's actually running at 50 hertz. I have tested the external HDMI port and it does run at 60 FPS, but again, not sure why Android is running at 50 hertz. But with that said, it is running a Mali G31 GPU. As for the Android version, it's running Android 9.0. Here we have the thermals of the CPU and the battery, which could be in anything. It could be just there to get the system going or it could be actually mapped to something else internally and that could very well be the actual LED lamp. So who knows? Now with the ATV launcher here, most of the apps do have some cool banners. However, if you don't have any banners for them, it will simply just give you an icon and have some text on the side. And if you don't like what that looks like, you can easily customize it yourself right inside the application itself, which is fantastic. And inside the ATV launcher here, we can also access the built-in Android settings, which is very handy. And this is the menu that we kind of skipped over before, just so we can take a look at it right now. So again, Wi-Fi settings, Straightforward, connect to your Wi-Fi, good to go. Bluetooth, as you can see here, we have a couple things connected. We have my keyboard, my Xbox wireless controller, and I can easily use it to navigate the entire system. And I have some truly wireless earbuds from Xiaomi connected to this projector. So if you're looking to watch something with wireless headphones, then you can definitely do that. Next up, we have the application settings, and that's where you can go ahead and quickly uninstall some applications or clear the cache. And by the way, this is the actual Android system menu. So if you're looking for some kind of hidden menu, it actually does not exist. It's been replaced with this right here. Now, one of the most handy features inside the menu here is actually the boot settings. And this is where you can go ahead and tell the projector what to do when it's turned on. You can either have it turn on the app of your choice or turn on the HDMI automatically when it's turned on, which again is very, very handy. You can go ahead and choose whatever application you like. And in my case, I just used the ATV launcher. On top of the home setting where I can set it to default, everything here is set just the way I want it. So once again, if you're someone who has an Xbox or a PlayStation that already has all the applications that they're looking for, you can go ahead and just set it to the HDMI and it will switch to that automatically. Then we have date, language, projection image settings, which is basically the keystone correction and the zoom in and out, factory settings, local update, and finally the about section. So with that being said, let's go ahead and finally jump into RetroArch, talk about the response times of the projector, and basically conclude this video. So of course, RetroArch has a bunch of different cores. Some of them do work, some of them don't. 
Some of them are just not supported on Android. For example, the Dolphin Core that runs the GameCube and Wii games. And uh, we have Soul Calibur, we have Mario Kart, unfortunately we cannot run them since we have nothing to run them with. However, Nintendo 64 games like Banjo-Kazooie does work perfectly fine and it runs at a pretty nice frame rate. I was able to run Super Mario Kart and things played pretty well. However, when it comes to Dreamcast, things just simply did not work. However, Sega Genesis works perfectly fine, as always, on pretty much any system. As for the PSP, it's a pretty interesting story. So running on the PPSPP, games run, but at a very horrible frame rate. I did try a whole bunch of settings and things never went the way I want them. But when it comes to RetroArch, games run like 1% of the time. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Whenever I launch these things, it actually just crashes RetroArch. Now, for lightweight games like Loco Roco, it does work really nicely. It's very fluid, looks amazing, you can even kind of upscale it and have a nicer experience. But for things like Outrun 2006, which was already pushing the PSP hardware to its limits at the time, uh, it is going to be a laggy experience if you do get it to run. And finally, for PlayStation, running games here just simply crashes the system and uh, you can't even turn off the projector unless you turn it off from the power. That's pretty much RetroArch. You can play some games, you just gotta be fiddling around with it. Of course, go ahead and set up your controller. In my case, I have the Xbox Series X controller, and it works beautifully with the system. So there is a chance to play some proper retro games here and have a good time with the built-in system. If you wanna run anything heavy like Dolphin, which I currently cannot install on the system, or Read Dream to run Dreamcast, you're gonna definitely start running into a lot of storage problems. That's why I'm currently actually running games directly from my USB, which is formatted in NTFS, and specifically, this is a Sandex Extreme Pro. So yeah, the USB interface here can definitely handle most USB devices. And other than that, once again, if you're looking to play some games, you can definitely do so by running it through the HDMI, and the response time for this projector is actually pretty good. It's right in line with budget TVs nowadays, which uh, kind of vary from 35 to 40, and roughly with this projector, we are getting around 30 milliseconds of lag, which is honestly pretty great for a projector like this. Now with all that being said, there are a few things I want to point out. One of them, of course, is the dust that's inside the lens. Now, it could be just my luck, maybe it was a test unit, who knows, after a couple weeks of use, has a bunch of dust inside the lens. Now, of course, these are microscopic, and whenever you shine light on any dust particle, it's going to look much worse than it should be. So if that's the case, that the dust I see here actually accumulated while using it over a period of two weeks, then yes, it's going to be an issue maybe after a year, where the image is going to be slightly softer. Of course, you can always take it apart and clean it up, and uh, it's something that you should expect with budget projectors in general. They sometimes come with dust out of the factory, microscopic particles make their way in. But with that said, that is something you should keep in mind. Now, another thing you'll notice here is actually a scratch across the screen. And if you remember when we did the focus test, the top right corner and the bottom left corners were actually kind of blurry compared to the top left and the bottom right corners. Which if you look at the scratch pattern, then uh, that is the case. Now of course I did check the unboxing footage and surely enough the scratch here was there out of the box. And if you're wondering, the lens here is actually glass, it's not plastic, so I can't even buff it out. With something like PolyWatch. So, these are two things you should keep in mind. My only other real issue here would have to be the built-in speakers that are kind of overhyped in marketing, but on my testing, I just found them to be all right. They're not special. They can get pretty damn loud, and we have no equalizer control over them, so we can't even tune the audio to sound how we want it. In some instances, it sounds great, while in other content, specifically when someone is speaking, it sounds like it's ear piercing. Maybe there's some built-in processing that's going on where it might detect vocals and decide to kind of play with the EQ and just make it sound not that great. So I would definitely recommend a pair of speakers to use with this thing if you're into uh, watching movies. However, if you're just getting this for your kids, it's going to be perfectly fine. They're not going to care. The speakers here are good enough. Other than that, one thing I really appreciate about the projector is that the fan noise here is not that loud compared to the typical budget projector that you get. It's kind of a nice calm hum, it hovers around 48 to 50 decibels, and overall it's just not that distracting. The other nice thing that I appreciate while making this video is that there's absolutely no plastic smell, and on top of that, it doesn't make my room hot. In the past, recording projector videos in the dark with a closed room has been painful. The fan was too loud, the projector was basically a heater, and it produced a ton of plastic smell, which actually gave me a headache. And with that being said, that is pretty much it for this long video. 
So should you get it for $289? I would say absolutely yes. Of course, as long as you're okay with the issues that I have listed, which is the dust, which can be managed and cleaned up later, and the scratch on the lens, which could once again just be my luck. Other than that, this is a fantastic offering. It's plenty bright, response times are great, has built-in Android, and all that is inside a really nice form factor. And if you have enjoyed this video, stick around since we have a couple more very interesting projectors coming up and we might actually revisit the Allison Z3 sometime in the future and do a comparison. So yeah, if you have any questions, do let me know in the comment section below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care everyone.